Good morning, everyone. For our friends on Facebook Live, welcome to our service. And for on YouTube, and for everybody in this room, welcome to our service today. It's a beautiful winter day, and we are so glad that we can come and worship together. So I'm going to ask us to stand, please, and we are going to sing several songs together.
Amen. Please be seated. Let's bow in prayer. Oh God, we acknowledge today that we need you and we need you every hour. Lord, we also open our hearts to you today. Lord, we pray that through your Holy Spirit you would come and work in our lives, even in these moments that are before us and in the week that is before us. Lord, we commit ourselves once again to you. Lord, thank you that you are precious to us, that we can love you, that we can worship you, we can share the praises from our hearts, the gratitude that's deep down inside of us even today. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We will ask our children and middle schoolers to head off to their groups at this time. When I was in college, one of my roommates one day said my grandmother or some family member had given to him some money for the upcoming spring break. And he said, I would like to go to Washington, D.C. for a couple of days, and would you like to come with me? So I said, okay, sure, that would, that would be great. He says, I'll drive if you would be the navigator. And I said, well, I've never been to Washington, D.C. before. I don't know anything about that city. I don't know the roads. I don't know any of that. So he reassured me. He said, I've gone there many times with my family over the years, and, and don't worry about it. We can get around. And he says, in doubt, when we're in Washington, D.C., if we're lost, just look for the Capitol building. It's a really large building. It's way up on a hill, a high spot in the city, and we'll never, we can never get lost. So, okay. So we headed off on our trip during the first part of spring break, and we probably got to Washington, D.C. around 11 o'clock in the morning. And we didn't have any reservation for a motel. I mean, we're college students, and we're just kind of enjoying our time. And so he said, we're going to stay in Maryland, which is right outside of Washington, D.C. So, okay. And for whatever reason, they're like, no, let's go to the other side of Washington, D.C. Let's go over to the Virginia side, and we'll find a motel there. So, okay. I said, I don't know where we are, and you're driving. So we get over to the Virginia side, and he said, no, I think it would be better if we went and stayed the night in Maryland. So, okay. So there's the best way to do that is the most direct way is to go right through Washington, D.C. So next thing I know, that's what we are, we're doing. We're on an interstate, and I'm looking, and we're driving by the Pentagon, and I'd never seen that before, so I was like, wow. And then we drive by the Lincoln Memorial, and I was like, wow. I'm looking ahead, and there's Washington Monument, and I'm looking for the White House, and the Capitol building is off in the distance. And so I'm just like overwhelmed at seeing all these things that I'd you know, seen on TV, but had never seen in person before. And all of a sudden, we stop, and there's this fork in the interstate and one goes to the left, right, and one goes to the left, and we just stop, and he says, which way do we go? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know where we are. And he says, well, look around for the Capitol building. So I'm like, literally looking around, and it's like, I don't see any Capitol building anywhere. What we found out later is the Capitol building literally was, we we're almost underneath the Capitol building. That's why I couldn't see it from, from our point of view. And so he's like, well, do, you, do we go to the right, or do we go to the left? I said, I don't know. So I said, okay, I'm the navigator. We're going to the right. And he says, why do you want to do that? And I said, I don't know. We're just going to the right. I, I think that's the way we need to go. So we did, and we eventually got to Maryland. Now, why do I tell you that story this morning? Because the Bible tells us that for every human being, we have to make a decision. We have to make a choice. And there's two options. One option is to accept Christ to believe in Christ, to trust in him, and the other option is to reject him. And there's only two choices. Now maybe this morning you're here or you're watching today and you're at the fork in the road. And maybe you've been there for some time, but you can't stay there forever because you have to go and make that decision. And there's only two options. Do you accept and believe in Christ or do you reject him? 
Now my Bible is open again today to 1 Peter chapter two, and we're gonna come back and look at verses that we looked at last week, but in a different way. And Peter tells us of these two options, he gives us more information. In 1 Peter chapter two in verse six, let me read verses six and seven for us. It says, for in scripture it says, see I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. Now, by the way, this cornerstone that he's talking about is probably about the size of this communion table. It is the key piece in a foundation of a building or just above the foundation, and everything else goes in and lines up to this. So just there were some questions this week of what is a cornerstone? It's about that size. So he says, see, I lay a stone in Zion in Jerusalem, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious. So Peter tells us some really important information about those who accept and believe in Christ. First of all, he says that you're never going to be put to shame. That when Jesus becomes the foundation of your life, the cornerstone of your faith, you can trust in him and he's never going to let you down. He says that in verse 6. And then in verse 7, he says, for those who make that choice to believe, Jesus is going to become precious to you. You're going to fall in love with him more and more and more and more, and Jesus will be very precious to you. But let's continue the second half of verse seven and verse eight. But to those who do not believe, this stone the, reject, the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, the cornerstone of faith, and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, the gospel message, which is also what they were destined for. So those who reject Jesus will stumble and fall. They, they fall because they reject the message of the gospel, this good news of Jesus. And we'll put Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 on the screen. And Peter says this early on, uh, the very beginning of the church age, and he says, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become this cornerstone. And then he says this, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. But when people hear that message, and in the last 2,000 years, there's been hundreds of millions of people that have heard that, and they said, I don't believe that. I don't believe this is true. I don't even know Jesus exists. If he does, I don't want anything to do with him. I'm going to reject him. And in verse 8, what Peter says here, a stone that causes people to stumble a rock or ledge that makes them fall. So let me illustrate it this way. If you were out on a hike and going down a pathway that you've never gone before and you're just walking along and all of a sudden there's a piece of ledge that's sticking up out of the ground and you go and you hit that with your toe and you go and it causes you to stumble and then to fall down the ground What Peter is saying here, you stand up and it's like, oh, that rock, I hate this rock. It made me trip and made me stumble and made me fall. And, you know, going back to your vehicle, you get a sledgehammer and you just start wailing on this piece of ledge because it's like, that is what made me trip and fall. And I hate this ledge. And I'm just gonna, it it, it shouldn't be here. It's gonna destroy this piece of ledge. That's what happens when a person rejects Christ. That Jesus is not precious to them at all. Instead, Jesus is despised by them and hated by them. So when it comes to Jesus, there is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. You either must go one way or go the other, and you must either accept Jesus or to reject him. 
Now, the sermon today is in three parts, and this is the first part. And let me ask you this question. What will you decide? Will Jesus be the cornerstone, the foundation of your life, or will he be the ledge that will cause you to stumble and fall? Because you have to make a choice. You can't stay in the fork in the road forever. You have to ultimately make that decision. And so it's something to think about. What will you decide? Now, part two of the message today from 1 Peter chapter 2 is that Jesus was rejected by his own people. So 2,000 years ago, when Jesus came to earth, he was rejected from the very beginning, and he was rejected by his own people. If we go back to verse 4 that we looked at last week, Peter says, as you come to him, come to Jesus, the living stone, the stone that gives to you eternal life, rejected by humans. Think of it. Millions and tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people have rejected Christ over these last 2,000 years. In John chapter 1, verse 11, it says, Jesus came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. That previous verse says that Jesus made everything, made all the people of the world. But when he came to his own people, when he came to humans, they rejected him. When Jesus came to his own people, the nation of Israel, they rejected him. They rejected him as the Christ and the Messiah, as their king. Now, about 10 days ago, I gave you some homework, and a number of you have had questions on that, and I asked you to go and to look at and to examine Matthew chapter 21. Now, Matthew chapter 21, in the first part of that chapter, talks about Palm Sunday. Now, we're pretty familiar with Palm Sunday. It's like, okay, Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Easter. We celebrate it as a church. Remember, we have palm branches up here, and we have palm branches there, and and we take those on Palm Sunday. But what is Palm Sunday? What is that all about? Well, the beginning of Matthew 21, let's just take a couple minutes to look at this uh, chapter. Palm Sunday is when Jesus is going to go into the city of Jerusalem, and the people take off their coats, their jackets, and they throw them on the street. What we would say today is giving Jesus the red carpet treatment. And people cut off branches from the palm trees, and they go and they begin to wave them, and it's a very festive occasion. And then people begin to cry out to him, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Even the children join in. And there's this great celebration. But the religious leaders are standing at a distance, and they're very upset at what's happening. Because actually, what is happening was predicted in Psalm 118. And if you go and look at that, and some of you have recently, it talks about this very thing. It says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It predicts that they will take the palm branches and wave them in in a festive way. And so the religious leaders, they, they say to Jesus, okay, you need to tell your people, stop it. You tell these kids to shut up. They cannot be saying this stuff. And Jesus says to them, if I was to tell them to be quiet, even these stones would cry out because this has been predicted that this has to happen, that they would cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But the religious leaders on that occasion, this is one week or so before Jesus is crucified and comes back to life, They said, okay, enough is enough with this Jesus of Nazareth. We reject him. We reject him. And so in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus says, let me tell you two stories. Let me tell you two parables. I want us to look at the second parable. That's the one I've kind of given you for homework a few few days ago. 
And this story is a very interesting story. And it goes like this. Jesus said that there is a man that owned a vineyard. And he doesn't actually live at the vineyard. He is some distance away. So he has hired these tenants, these people that, these farmers that would uh, take care of the vineyard for him. And the story goes that there was no fruit that was being bared at the, at the vineyard. And so the owner from a distance sends to them his own servants to tell them how to be fruitful. But Jesus says in the story that they go and they stone these servants and they kill them. And then Jesus says the owner sends his own son to the vineyard and the tenants go and they kill the son. Now, I gave you a cheat sheet a, a while ago of this story, that the owner is God the Father, that the tenants are the religious leaders, and they're not bearing any fruit. The servants that were sent were the Old Testament prophets, and they were, they were stoned, they were killed. And the son, of course, is Jesus himself. But then in Matthew 21, in verse 42, Jesus says them, this to them. He says, have you never read in the scriptures, in the Old Testament scriptures, the stone the builders rejected have become, has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in your eyes. He says, therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, you religious leaders, and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' stories, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him. But they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that Jesus was a prophet. Now this is literally four or five days before they do come up with a plan. And what happens? The religious leaders were offended by Jesus, that he was claiming to be the Messiah, the Christ, their king. They hated him. They did. They, they hated him. They had him arrested. They had him tortured. They had him killed. They had him executed by the Romans. They hated Jesus, the rejected Christ. So as we come to the communion table at the end of part two of the message today, I want us to remember the rejected Christ. So if you could take your bread and your cup and open this container, and on the very top is this wafer bread material, And I want us to remember that Jesus was arrested, he was tortured, he was executed. Let's eat of the bread together. Let's also open the juice portion and let's drink this together. This is a reminder of the shed blood of Christ upon the cross. Let's drink it together. So, so far this morning, in part one, that there is two options. We can accept or reject Christ. Part two, Jesus was rejected. But the third part is we come back to 1 Peter chapter 2, and as we go through the rest of our study in 1 Peter over the coming weeks, you need to be aware of this, and it's this. You will be rejected for following Jesus. 
you will be rejected for following Jesus. That's what this whole book of 1 Peter is about. The world rejects and hates Christians because we are followers of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 3.12 says it this way. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Will be persecuted. Now, we live in America, and America, we're almost the exception to the rule. But, with that being said, the expectation must be is that at times we will be excluded from certain groups. We will be shunned simply because we are followers of Christ. We will be rejected, maybe even from family members. And we may be persecuted, as millions of Christians around the world are being persecuted today. So here's the takeaway. It's not a very pleasant one, but it is the truth. We must expect that people will reject us and hate us because we are followers of Jesus. So that must be our expectation. We must expect that people will reject us and hate us because we are followers of Jesus. The world rejected Jesus, and they will reject us as well. Now, in over 50 nations around the world today, there's a hostile environment for Christians. Now, there's only, you know, 100-some nations, so almost in half of the nations around the world, there is a hostile environment towards Christian people. Again, simply because they're Christians. They're followers of Jesus for no other reason But there are 12 nations right now in 2021 that the experts would say is not just hostile, but is a severe, severe situation. And what do I mean by that? That on any given moment, at any given time, on any given day in these next 12 months, that Christians, followers of Jesus in these 12 nations, that they can expect that they will be injured, beat up simply for being a Christian. They will be imprisoned simply for being a Christian. Their house might be burnt down. Their church building might be burnt down. And yes, they also need to expect that on any given day in these next 12 months that they will be killed simply for being a follower of Jesus. And we say, that's almost hard to believe, but that is the truth. And that's the way it's been for 2,000 years. It's nothing new. It is part of human history. Now, over the last 12 months or so, I have seen some great YouTube videos on this subject. And on one that I'm thinking of today that I want to share with you just briefly is a story of a small group of Christian people in one of these nations that I've just described. They're in basically hiding. They don't have a church building. They, they, they have to secretly meet and worship, and, and everything is in secret. Otherwise, terrible things would happen to them. And in this video, an American pastor goes to visit this group of Christians simply to go and to encourage them and that's what this video is about. And so this American pastor is there and, and has been sharing and encouraging and teaching them. And at the end of the video, these Christians in this hostile nation says, when you go back to America, please ask American Christians to pray for us. And the pastor said, absolutely. We will absolutely do that. And then these Christians said, please ask them to pray that we might become like the American church, where there's freedom of worship, we can, they can own their Bibles, they can go to church whenever they want to. And this American pastor rightly said, no, I will never ask the American church to pray that you folks would become like them. And he says, for you folks, you walked hours just to get here to visit with me. You don't have your own Bibles, but you have the scriptures memorized by little pieces of paper 
a sentence at a time. And when the authorities come and they get too close to where you are, you have memorized it and then you eat it to get rid of the evidence. He says, American Christians would never do that. He says, we will pray for you, but not that you will become like us. But I would ask you that you would pray for us in America for three things. He says, I would pray, I would ask you to pray that we would have the strength to give up our sinful habits that you don't seem to have. I would ask you to pray that we would give up our petty differences that you don't seem to have. And I would ask you to pray for us Christians in America that we would learn to major, not major on the minor things, but to only major in the things that are really important. Because he says, that's what you folks here do. And we need to be more like you. Not that, we're, not that I'm asking you, God, for persecution to come to our country, but we need to be more like you. So that really grabbed my attention when I watched that video, and I've watched it several times over the last year or so. So two things I want us to do before we're done this morning. I don't know if Christians in these closed countries will ever see or be able to watch this sermon today, but maybe they will at some point. So I'd like to directly focus my attention for a moment on the camera and on those that are watching and listening to this video, and to say to you that you are not alone and that we will stand with you and we will pray for you wherever you are around the world. And would you pray for us that we would be strong to be able to overcome these sinful habits that oftentimes we have, that we would get rid of our petty differences and that we would not major on the minor things and only the things that are important. Now the last thing I don't want us to do this today is to take some time to pray for these brothers and sisters in Christ around the world that are in conditions that we could never imagine finding ourselves in. And then I just want to say this, that at 11 o'clock this morning, I have programmed an email to be sent out to each of you, listing an alphabetical order of the 40-some nations that we can be praying for with Christians. And so I'd ask you to do that uh, this week. But let's, since we're here, let's take some time and pray for these brothers and sisters in Christ right now. Dear God, thank you, first of all, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And for us here today in this room, Jesus is so precious to us, and we love him so much. But Lord, we know that there are millions of people around the world today that cannot stand Jesus. They hate him, they hate his name, they hate everything about him. And they also hate his followers. And so Lord, today we pause to take some time to pray for the millions of people that find themselves in a situation simply because they have trusted in you, they have believed in your name for salvation, that they may be, even this day, be beat up, injured, simply for being a Christian. They may be in jail or prison right now, or they may experience it, or they have experienced it sometime in recent past. We would pray for them today. Maybe even the ones that maybe they're even being tortured, God, and we would pray for them that they would be able to endure all of these hardships. Maybe their house has been burnt down. Maybe their church building has been burnt down. And Lord, we would pray for families today all around the world that their loved ones have died, even recently or in times past, simply because they're Christian people, followers of Jesus. God, we would pray for these families today that, has, that carry so much hurt and suffering. Lord, we would pray for them today. And Lord, we would pray for ourselves as the American church. 
where sometimes we may be shunned, but really rejected, and, and really we've oftentimes never experienced persecution at all. We can't even imagine it. We can't even imagine that's happening in our world right now. But God, we pray for the American church today. God, that we would learn to major on the things that are really important. That we would get rid of our petty differences. And Lord, that we would go and cast away our sinful habits, the things that would bind us and keep us from where you would want us to be. And Lord, that through your Holy Spirit and through the Word of God that we've been looking at in the last few weeks, that you would go and change our hearts, Lord, even though we are not going through times of persecution. And Lord, we are so thankful and grateful today that we do have the freedom and liberty to come to this place and to even worship from our homes, wherever we are, wherever we're gathered today, without fear that the police or the army are going to come in and break down the doors and to arrest us or to harm us or even to kill us. Lord, today we are so grateful for the freedom that as American people we have. Lord, I would pray for United Baptist Church in Old Town, that you would continue to strengthen us, to make us healthy and strong. Lord, that we would be the people, the men and women, the teenagers, the children that you'd want us to be, that we would more and more reflect the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, we worship you, we praise you, we adore you. You are so, so very precious to us. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be on this journey with you, this faith journey, to know you and to be in relationship with you, to serve you, to worship you. Today we come as grateful people, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship team, please come and close our service. I'll invite you to stand and join us in worship for our last song. Tell me.
seated. have several announcements before we close our time together today. And I would like to announce something new. I haven't been able to do that for like a year. Something new at our church. And we are calling it Discipleship Journey Workshops. Discipleship Workshops. And so starting next Sunday, February 28th, and for four Sundays in a row, from 11.10 to 12 noon, we are inviting you to take part in four different sessions, really of how to be a disciple maker, how to make disciples for Jesus. Our mission that we've been talking about for the last few years is we are going to make more disciples for Jesus. And the question has been, how do we do that? Well, we are finally at the place that we have new material. This is new material that has not been offered before. It is very practical. The content is rich, very helpful, and the sessions will be on Zoom if you cannot be here in the building, and uh, we're also hoping to record the sessions as well. There are more details in the Baptist Hill notes that was sent out, the weekly update that was sent out to you by email or by mail this week, and so Discipleship Journey Workshops starting next Sunday, February 28th, right after the service at about 11.10. Final announcement is I know a number of you find the Daily Breads very helpful, and uh, because of the pandemic, the production was off for a while. Uh, we have got the updated ones from the previous three months, and the next three months, starting March 1st, are also available out here around the corner. So make sure that you pick those up uh, before you leave today. So at this time, we are going to wish our friends on Facebook Live and YouTube a great week, and the Lord bless you. Thank you for joining us today, and hope you can join us again next Sunday at 10 a.m.